Well, it's great to be with you all again, um, if even from afar. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to, to speak again. Um, we've had some heavy weather move through here, so fingers crossed we don't have a power outage or something in the middle of all this. And my allergies here are not what they were in, in uh, Colorado Springs, so <laughs> I may get out of breath here <laughs> periodically, and for that I, I apologize. Um, again, if you're if you're not on, on on mute, if you would kindly do so, that would be a, a, a great benefit to me. Um, well, the title of this talk is not a rhetorical question. <laughs> it certainly could be because there's plenty of reasons to loathe flies or even fear them, uh, given the many diseases that they can transmit and 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 the discomfort that they can cause us. But there's a lot of positive things that they do for us too. And, you, and you, if you know me at all, you know that I'm going to talk about the good things flies do as well as the bad things they do. And I, flies are so incredibly diverse. They're, they're probably in the top two uh, groups of insects that for, for most diversity, wasps being the other. You might get some argument from people who study beetles as well, but the more we learn about flies, the more we know we don't know. And uh, new species are being described all the time. I can't cover even all the families that, that you can encounter there in Colorado, but I wanted to hit the ones that you're most likely to see, both indoors, by the way, and out, and ones that have some kind of relationship to birds. Since this is an Audubon group, I think it's only fair that we spotlight some of those. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll move on here. Well, flies can be very beautiful, by the way. We, we tend to think of flies as kind of dingy, dull, gray things or brown things, but here, here we have an example, a, a male yellow dung fly, brilliantly uh, colored with gold scales and hairs on its body. And it's a good example of, of flies in general. Uh, how, do you, how do you identify a fly anyway? Well, for one thing, flies have only one pair of wings. Almost all other insects, if they have wings, have two pair. And in flies, the second pair has been reduced to a stalked knob. I don't know if you can see my cursor here. I hope so. Uh, and right under the, right at the, at the base of the hind leg, you can see a little yellow thing coming down from the body of the, of the fly, and that's called a halter. And so the second pair of wings has been reduced to this contraption that acts as kind of like a gyroscope to balance the fly when it's flying mm -hmm. and orient it a little bit. So that's a very unique feature of, of flies that other insects do not possess. Flies typically have very large eyes for the, you know, they take up most of the head uh, that to an extreme degree in many male flies, and we'll, we'll see that here as we go along. Flies also tend to have very short antennae. Uh, here we have the, the pair of antennae jutting out between the eyes, very short. They have usually a, a hair-like thing coming out of the third antennal segment. That's called an arista, and it's in their sensory appendages as they are with, with other insects. Flies have different mouth parts than most insects. Most insects have chewing mouth parts. Flies do not. They either have sponging mouth parts where they have like a, you know, a sponge that comes down off their chin and sops up moist uh, foods for them. Uh, or they have piercing sucking mouth parts with which we're all too familiar, I'm sure. But that's, that gives you a good, good idea of what flies are compared to, to other insects. So what, what do flies do for us? Uh, you know, or what, what is their economic impact on humanity? Overwhelmingly, it's, it's one of, of public health. It's the health of pets and livestock as well. As I mentioned, many flies carry, the, that bite us anyway, many flies carry diseases that can be, you know, can cause either mortality or extreme discomfort. And of course, this is more, happens more in, in tropical and underdeveloped nations, but, but here at home with climate change, we might be seeing more of that encroaching uh, into the Northern hemisphere as well. Flies can also be crop pests. 
the Hessian fly is a particular crop pest of wheat, if I'm recalling correctly. And the fly pictured here is a type of, of pomace fly. Uh, we tend to call these fruit flies, although they're not a true fruit fly. This, this particular species is a recent introduction and it is known to infest grapes and other soft fruits. So it's a potential pest in, in vineyards and, is, and uh, agriculture officials are keeping a close eye on it. On the flip side, flies have been employed and imported to be biological controls of noxious weeds. The example I'm showing here is a, a type of true fruit fly that was introduced to control uh, invasive thistle species. But flies have also been introduced to control invasive insects. Uh, the gypsy moth comes to mind. A fly was introduced to be a parasitoid of the gypsy moth. Unfortunately, it decided our native giant silk moths were much more, uh, well, much better hosts than, than the, the gypsy moth. And so it's become a pest in its own right. So there are a lot of, of difficulties when you talk about introducing insects as biological controls. In the wild, uh, flies provide many beneficial ecosystem services, not the least of which is pollination. Now, flies are, are not harvesting pollen as bees do. They're flower visitors. They're there to, to sip nectar to fuel their flight. But many flies are very hairy, and, and so pollen gets stuck to them and transport to other flowers uh, by accident. Um, well, and it, the same happens with bees, but bees are actually are actively harvesting pollen. Flies also play an important role in decomposition of all kinds of organic matter, both animal and plant. And they're an integral part of the food web, both as, as victims, as the wasp is showing, chowing down on a fly, and as predators. Uh, here we have a robber fly that has killed a grasshopper. Well, let's get the, let's get the bad ones out of the way first. How does that sound? Uh, Horse flies and, and deer flies are found chiefly in wetland areas and riparian corridors uh, because they, their larval stage is typically aquatic and their, their larvae are predatory on other organisms in aquatic habitats. Um, but boy, I tell you, they are a pretty animal even so. <laughs> uh, they typically have Horse flies typically have these horizontal stripes of psychedelic colors running through their eyes, but if you get mesmerized, then you're liable to get bit. And in, in this case, um, horse flies and deer flies have cutting jaws. So under, under the chin of, the, of this, this fly on the left there, uh, you have these blade-like organs uh, under, the, under the palps that are hanging down there. And those blades cut a hole in you, and then they sop up the blood that flows out of you. And they also apply an anticoagulant so you keep bleeding even after they're gone. So not, not friendly flies um, at all, as you can tell the lengths I've gone to to uh, <laughs> get these photos for. <laughs> but uh, I should have warned you that this is probably an R-rated or at least PG-rated presentation this time <laughs> because there's some very morbid things that, that flies do, not the least of which is, is uh, um, take up our blood. As I mentioned, horse flies grow up in water. And so here we have uh, a pair of female Western horse flies laying batches of eggs on vegetation overhanging the water. The larvae that hatch will fall into the water and begin their, their life cycle under there. Deer flies are typically smaller than then horse flies, horse flies can be very large, uh, you know, an inch long, at least uh, larger than that in some cases. Um, whereas deer flies are about house fly size, maybe a tad larger. And they have spotted eyes as opposed to the, the striped eyes of the horse flies, but they, they cut you up the same way. Not a lot of fun. Well, the most notorious biting flies are mosquitoes. And you have 44 species of them in, in Colorado. Only the female bites, by the way. She takes up blood to facilitate the production of eggs. Uh, the males 
feed on flower nectar and the females will as well because they need fuel for, for flying. Uh, you don't see them much in Colorado because it's very dry there. Uh, so if you have a wet year, that's when you're likely to see them because they breed uh, in, in the water. Here's the anatomy of a, of a mosquito in the, in the act of biting. And what we tend to think of as their proboscis is actually a bundle of several different segments that are highly modified from, from the chewing mouth parts that you see in other insects. And so the labium is, is the lower lip of the insect basically. And in this case, it's the sheath in which those stylets or needles uh, are, are housed. Um, and, and, and the palps are the little uh, appendages just under the eyes there. Um, Terry, can you please mute? In the category of fly. Terry Ayers, can you please mute? Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so this is how they take up, up blood and also how they inject anticoagulants and, and sometimes uh, disease organisms. Here we have a couple of, of, of species that I have found blacklighting. Uh, when I lived in, in Colorado Springs, the, 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 there's a female on the, on the left, a male on the right. You can see the male has plumose antennae. They're feathery like, that's to, to pick up the, the wing beats and, and sense of females. Uh, his palps are greatly elongated and, and bent upwards. So they look like tusks almost there, but they're not part of his, his uh, feeding mouth parts. That is the proboscis beneath the palps there. So here's the life cycle of, of mosquitoes. And they begin as eggs that are either laid singly uh, or in rafts like depicted here uh, in this illustration I prepared for, for an article I wrote once. Uh, they float on the surface, both as in, either as individuals or, or in rafts. And they hatch into larvae that are called wrigglers because they, they kind of uh, uh, waggle themselves up and down in the, the water column. And they have snorkels at the rear of their, of their uh, bodies. So they're breathing through their asses, basically. Uh, the <laughs> pupa stage are called tumblers because they also can go up and down in the water column. Uh, but, but they kind of, uh, because they're roundish, they tend to tumble as, as opposed to, to bend like the larvae do. And they breathe through these trumpet-like uh, uh, appendages on the back of the body there. Now, one insect, one fly that's often confused with mosquitoes are, are non-biting midges. This, this is a swarm of mostly male non-biting midges that I took out at Big Johnson Reservoir. Uh, they likewise grow up in aquatic habitats and they can form these enormous swarms, sometimes so, uh, so great that you hear them before you even see them. So you may see uh, a cloud of, of, uh, of these insects over you or over some other prominent object. And it's the males uh, making these swarms to attract the females into them and mating will take place in those swarms. They do not bite, uh, they're, they're totally harmless and they're so abundant as to be a major, major food source for many birds, uh, especially swallows and uh, aquatic birds like uh, grebes, for example, uh, and, and other shorebirds that, that uh, also that will pick them up. And midges come in a variety of sizes and shapes and colors, uh, all the colors of the rainbow, I swear I've seen in, in midges. They're very small or they, well, they, they can be very small. The one on the bottom right there is, is a fairly good size individual with his legs out. He's probably a quarter of an inch at least, but they don't get much larger than that. Most of them are considerably smaller and they're active at all hours of the day, but mostly at dusk and at dawn. Now there are biting midges and these are coll colloquially known as noceums or punkies uh, because they're so tiny, but they have a big bite for their, their size. Uh, and the, the good news, the good news is, is that the majority of biting midges feed on other insects. And so in the two photos below, 
when I was in Arizona, I saw this Arizona sister butterfly uh, taking up some, some minerals at a stream bank, but in turn, it was being uh, bitten by these swarms of, of biting midges that are uh, uh, you know, tapping into the wing veins of the, of the butterfly there and, and taking their fill of, of insect blood, which is called hemolymph. But biting midges will attack other animals they're, they're, they may or may not be host specific in, in what they choose to go after, uh, but they're, you know, they're very tiny. I haven't seen a lot of them in, in Colorado that are a, of a problem to humans. Mostly it's other animals. Black flies uh, are also known as buffalo gnats. They're also very small. Uh, this one was biting me up at the, at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo when I was waiting for Heidi one time. And, uh, and, and this did not feel good. For, for such a tiny fly, I couldn't believe how painful <laughs> his bite was or how to the, the degree to which it could swell uh, given its tiny size. But uh, that's one feature that's common to mosquitoes and, and other small biting flies is that they can expand their abdomens to accommodate a huge a blood meal. And meanwhile, they're, they're excreting water at the other end, as you can see in the final slide in the lower right there, the final picture in the lower right. It's excreting water so it can pack those blood cells into its, its uh, abdomen there. And, and only the female uh, uh, black flies bite. Uh, here we see the sexual dimorphism that is often rampant in flies, where the Female and male look like completely different species, if not completely different insects altogether. The, the male, his whole head is eyes, basically, on the right-hand side there. And then the female has these kidney-shaped eyes uh, and, and a body built for, for host seeking. As larvae, black flies live in fast-flowing streams, especially in riffles, and the larvae anchor their rear end to a rock and then they put out these kind of uh, windmill-like uh, sieves to filter uh, microorganisms out of the current. And then the pupa stage is also underwater and the fly, when it emerges, you know, literally shoots out of the, the pupa stage and through the, the uh, surface of the water and, and into the air. I've never seen that happen, but I imagine it must be something pretty amazing. So these are typical of, of higher elevations everywhere or higher latitudes. So by the time you get to Michigan or, or, or Canada or Minnesota, these things are a real, uh, real nuisance, if not, um, you know, a bloodletting fiesta there. <laughs> There's one other blood feeding fly that is very common. It's a stable fly. It's related to house flies. It's in fact, to look at this fly, you would think it was a house fly. It looks almost identical, except for that big giant spear coming out of its face, which is what it uses to bite you with. Uh, a very painful bite again, unfortunately. Um, but these are found principally where, where non-humans are. So around ranches and, and, and the zoo and, and other places with large, large mammals that they typically go after. But if you're a convenient, uh, uh, conveniently nearby, they will go after you too. Now here's a really interesting story. We used to have another biting fly here in prehistoric times. We had tsetse flies here, if you can believe this. Um, the fossil in the upper left there is from Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument. And it's a giant compared to the tsetse flies that occur still but are confined now to Africa. And so to look at the map of Africa there where tsetse flies still occur to the tune of 20 some species, uh, they occupy this central band that is called the fly belt. And the fly belt expands and contracts with the, the rainy season and the dry season. And so that's why you have these uh, you know, nomadic tribes of Bushmen that, that herd cattle is they have to, to uh, stay out of that fly belt because the TC fly, while it does 
carry the disease organism for sleeping sickness in humans, that same microorganism causes another, another disease in cattle called Nagana. Now, African wildlife are immune to Nagana, but they serve as a reservoir for the microorganism. So you can imagine what might happen if we obliterated the tsetse fly. Uh, we have currently these kind of um, you know, nomadic, uh, you know, um, you know, grazing herds of, of cattle on a small scale. Uh, we would have commercial cattle ranches there if it weren't for the tsetse fly keeping uh, cattle at bay, basically. Uh, so is the tsetse fly a pest? Uh, well, yeah, it impacts human health, not to the degree it used to, but it certainly impacts the health of livestock. But on the other hand, it's also a guardian of the wildlife we're familiar with in Africa. So now we're going to go indoors for a minute uh, and talk about some of the flies you're likely to see in and around your home. And of course, the most abundant or most um, familiar might be what what you would call a fruit fly. Technically, they're called pomace flies or vinegar flies. They're very, very fond of fermenting substances. So wine, uh, overripe bananas, <laughs> those kinds of things are what draw them. They seem to come out of nowhere, but they're very small. So it's easy for them to squeeze through window screens and, and uh, come in the, the door or window when it's uh, open even for a few seconds. And they're very, they have very acute senses to uh, make a beeline for whatever item is attractive to them. The larvae develop in those fermenting uh, substances. And so they're, they're a nuisance, not usually a pest or a threat to human health that I'm aware of, certainly. And in fact, they can be of great benefit to human health. Uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan uh, is pictured here. He used the fruit fly as a organism for the study of genetics. Now, Drosophila melanogaster is the, the laboratory fruit fly he used. And it salivary glands have these enormous chromosomes that are easy to work with under the microscope. And now to this day, we've actually sequenced the genome for, for this species of fruit fly. And come to find out, we share 60% of our DNA with it. And to top that off, these fruit flies share 75% of the same genes known to cause diseases in humans. So you can see how incredibly important this organism is as a research animal. The, the generations turn around very quickly. So whereas you would have you know, a, a long period of gestation for even mice, um, you know, a fruit fly generation can turn around in a week or two. Uh, Morgan won a Nobel Prize for his, his work uh, on these fruit flies, but we're still learning uh, more about them today and, and the applications to, to medicine are profound. So if you like bananas, well, hey, there you go. A fly that looks very similar to, to a, a fruit fly or a pomace fly are a scuttle flies or humpback flies. They're about the same size, but they behave very differently. Whereas fruit flies tend to fly slowly and then land on something and stay there for a while. Scuttleflies run. They run and stop and run again and run some more and then stop again. And sometimes if you get close to them, they will fly, but they're, they're mostly uh, actively running around on foot and their larvae are developing in like the garbage disposal in your sink or in other uh, wet decaying organic matter. Uh, they're small enough they can get into to garbage cans even if they're covered. If the lid is one of those that, that flips open or something, they can get in there easily and, uh, and start breeding in there. Again, typically a nuisance, not something you need to worry about usually from, from a health standpoint, as far as I know. These things are really interesting too. You, you see them, they're very small, uh, but you see them on like the, the sink uh, or a sink basin or on the wall of the bathroom and especially the drain fly. I, I get a kick out of the fact that it's called Clogmia is the genus name. It doesn't clog your drain. Uh, it might actually help alleviate clogs because the larvae 
are, are in the drain trap eating uh, decaying organic matter down there and in other places in your, in your bathroom too, probably, or maybe around the kitchen sink. Um, but they look like little tiny moths. They're all fluffy and feathery and, and scaly like a, like a moth would be, uh, but they're little tiny flies. And there are other species that live outdoors uh, as the one in the bottom left there. And also in this family are sand flies. And I've only seen one specimen and it's depicted on the lower right there. Uh, in, in other regions of the world, uh, sand flies are biters and they can transmit leishmaniasis. So not, not a good fly to encounter abroad. Here in the States, not an issue. Another really abundant fly in households are, are dark-winged fungus gnats. Uh, they're typically these little black things that invariably wind up drowning in the soap dish or <laughs> <laughs> that's where I usually find them, drowned in the soap dish. Uh, but their breeding, excuse me, as larvae, typically in overwatered house plants, they're feeding on the roots maybe of the plants or on, on uh, the decaying roots if, if you've overwatered them and they get start getting mold or fungus on them. Uh, the, the larvae of these flies will infest that. The flies themselves, as adult flies, only live about a day or two. Uh, maybe three. Uh, they're, they're not very long lived, but they're, they live long enough to be a nuisance because you, you run the risk of inhaling them if there's a good many of them in your, inside your home. We still don't know how many species there are. They're, they're very convoluted uh, taxonomically, and so scientists are still trying to make heads or tails about of how many species there are in, and in what genera. Well, housefly is, is you know, the, the typical poster child for an insect pest, but I, actually I rarely see them. Uh, I, I did find this one in our kitchen in, in, in Colorado Springs. Uh, they're supposed to be a mechanical vector for bacteria and viruses and things of this nature because of, they do visit animal feces and, and decaying carcasses and you know, all kinds of obnoxious things that harbor bacteria. But they also, like any other insect, groom fastidiously, as you can see in this series of, of photos. Uh, I mean, sometimes they look kind of devious, like, you know, when they rub their, their feet together, like they're potting something, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think that's giving them a little bit too much credit. Uh, I think, personally, that they're overblown as a source of contaminants, uh, unless you have a lot of them your odd one that comes into the kitchen, probably not going to be a problem. Uh, if you run a restaurant, uh, it pays to, to play it safe and put up the fly strips or, 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 or uh, look at other methods of control for them. Uh, but generally speaking, I haven't found them to be too, too terribly common. What people often confuse for, for house flies are blow flies. And they're substantially larger insects uh, typically, uh, you know, run a quarter of an inch or, or more. Uh, and here, here we have one, again, on our kitchen counter, it looks like, <laughs> uh, sopping up, up uh, food with its little pad, uh, padded proboscis there. Uh, flies typically take liquid food as adults, uh, not always, but most of the time. And uh, um, the, the Califords are, are typically gray. Uh, they may have... Uh, blue or green on their bodies as well. Cluster flies are a special type of, of blowfly. And they're, or they're, their genus name, Polenia, comes from the kind of golden uh, pollen or, or scales that they have on the thorax in fresh specimens. Uh, the, the larvae live in the soil and, and are predatory on, or parasitoids, excuse me, of, of earthworms. In many cases, there are some exceptions, but in many cases, the larvae are, are, are subterranean paras, uh, parasitoids of, of earthworms. The adult flies become a nuisance when they uh, go to overwinter under your siding or in your attic uh, or between the walls of your home, uh, where on a warm uh, winter day, they can come out suddenly and, and overwhelm you. Um, I have not experienced anything like that, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility. A lot of people have experienced that 
with cluster flies. And the blowflies in general, by the way, overwinter as adults. And so those are the flies you're gonna see basking on the sides of buildings on a warm winter day. This is your typical blue bottle fly. Uh, you can see the metallic you know, luster to its abdomen there. And these are the ones that uh, oviposit in, uh, in carrion. Uh, they do not frequent uh, feces much. I mean, if they can develop in that, but they much prefer, prefer carcasses. There are blowflies, by the way, that the special blowflies that are parasites of nestling birds. They, the female fly oviposits in the bird nest and then the, her larvae feed on the blood of the nestling birds. And this can cause bird mortality. Um, it, it can be a real problem for, for nestling birds, especially if you don't maintain your nest boxes uh, properly. So you know, be aware of that, that, that there are blowflies that, that can be a, a real pest. Uh, to, uh, to nestling birds that way. This is not one of them. <laughs> and then you have the, the green bottles that are brilliant metallic green or copper or gold. Uh, and, and they're definitely carrion feeders, um, but you'll see them on, on fecal matter as well. An another insect that gets mistaken for, for a house fly is, is a flesh fly. And these are, again, a little bit larger than a, than a housefly typically. They they're, tend to be more abundant. I see them more frequently than I do houseflies. And if it has bright red eyes on the front end and a red butt on the rear end, it's gonna be a flesh fly. Uh, the, the three racing stripes down the top of the thorax are another good clue. Uh, they're, they're very boldly marked flies with heavy black legs. Uh, they do an interesting thing and in that they visit carrion as well, but instead of laying eggs, the female lays live larvae. The first instar larvae are what she larva posits onto a carcass. And that gives her a, a advantage over competing blowflies because her larvae can go right to town immediately on a carcass, whereas the, the blowfly eggs have to hatch first and then they're behind uh, in, in competing with, with flesh flies. Very, very bizarre, uh, but not unheard of. It gets even weirder later uh, with, it, with some other kinds of flies I'll talk about. There's a subset of, of sarcophagids that are called satellite flies that have a completely different life history. And these are very small flies. Um, they, you will typically see them in arid areas or on vegetation where they sit briefly and then fly a little bit and sit again. And they're on the lookout for solitary bees and wasps and the female fly will lay her larva uh, at the edge of the, the nest burrow of the bee or wasp and, uh, and the, the crawl down there and then eat the, the, the pollen or, and nectar or the insects that the wasp has stored for its own offspring. And here we see a satellite fly harassing a digger wasp in, in Massachusetts. Uh, I don't know how I got this shot, <laughs> uh, but uh, you can see she's hovering over the thing. Uh, well, she's flying by actually. She'll look for an opportunity uh, to lay her egg at the nest entrance there, or lay her larva rather at the nest entrance there. Crane flies are sometimes called daddy long legs, but we, we don't like to use that name here because it confuses with uh, the harvestmen which are arachnids that we often call daddy long legs. Uh, crane flies are, are very long legged as you can see here. Those legs detach very easily. So it's, it's, uh, it's a miracle when you find one with its full complement of legs usually. <laughs> um, but as larvae, they are typically living in uh, organic matter such as decaying logs, uh, compost heaps, this kind of thing. Some live in the water and develop there. And some of those aquatic larvae are predatory, but most of them are, are also feeding on organic matter uh, in aquatic habitats. They all have this very leggy appearance uh, and are often seeking shelter during the heat of the day uh, on the walls of buildings, or uh, sometimes they fly to lights at night and you'll see them there around your porch light, uh, dancing with those long legs, looking very spidery more than fly-like. Crane flies 
it used to be all in one family, the Tapulidae, but, but they were eventually separated into other families. And the smaller ones, many of them are in the Limoneidae. And, and so these are a little bit larger than mosquito. And some even have a proboscis like a mosquito, which, which makes uh, their identification even more problematic up here in the upper right. Um, it takes a practice eye sometimes to tell uh, one fly from another. But the most amazing one is in the lower right. It's a wingless crane fly, uh, and it's, it's less than a quarter of an inch in length. And Linda Hodges found this one when we were hiking up in, in Gunnison Pass looking for ptarmigan. And, and she spotted this thing crawling on the snow, and I'd never seen one before. And I was not, uh, I was surprised given the size of most crane flies, how tiny it was. I, I knew there were such insects, but I never, never ever seen one before. Really, truly remarkable and unique uh, insects, something to, to look out for uh, in your winter journeys. Well, we mentioned how many flies are, how flies are pollinators. Well, soldier flies are, are among them. They're, they're often bee or wasp-like in appearance. Uh, they're not terribly abundant, but uh, you see them periodically, especially up in the foothills and at higher elevations there. Uh, some of them are, you know, this bright green color. Uh, they have long antenna for flies. You can see how long and, and, and the antenna are, you know, are held close together at, at, at the base and then, you know, you know, uh, spread out as, as, it, as it gets longer. They have two antennae. It just looks like one antenna in a Y shape. And here are some more examples. Not all of them have, they're, they're a diverse family, so not all of them are very large. Uh, you know, this one in the upper right and the lower left are about the size of a, of a pomace fly, a vinegar fly, uh, and they have kind of short antenna compared to the larger ones that have a longer antenna and look like bees or wasps. Robber flies uh, are really diverse there in Colorado because they're typical of, of arid habitats, but then you get into higher elevations and, and there's different species up there than you see elsewhere in the state. Uh, these are two that you can find right now. They're, they're active late into fall and they're, they're relatively small and, and blackish. Uh, you'll, you'll see a comentella on fence posts or fence rails. Uh, where they sit and wait and watch for other insects that they prey on. And Bacamaya, uh, typically on vertical surfaces, uh, tree trunks, walls of outbuildings like, like here at, at Cheyenne Mountain State Park. But other, I mean, they're, they're very diverse in robber flies in their, in their forms. And so here we have bee mimics that you typically find in the foothills and, and the higher up you go. And they're about the size of a bumblebee, and they look the part too. And, but they behave a little bit differently. They'll sit on a log or uh, a, a leaf in a sunlit patch of forest, and you'll see them cock their heads. They behave a lot like, like a flycatcher in that they'll dash out after some insect flying overhead, uh, spear it with that big heavy beak they have, inject a venom that kills the prey instantly, and then they take it back to their perch to... To, uh, uh, to, to feed on. And then the, the, the venom also has enzymes that, that digest the insect from the inside out. And so it's withdrawing that liquefied insect as it feeds. Uh, hanging thieves are, are called such because they will apprehend a, a victim and then hang themselves up by their hind or middle legs, usually their middle legs, their second pair of legs, and then manipulate their prey with the, their remaining legs as they, as they feed invariably they, they suck from the, the, the butt of their prey. I have no idea wh why they go for that end of the prey, but <laughs> that's what I usually find them, them doing. Uh, Stigopogon is a little one that is found in typically along beaches and, and uh, the, the sandy banks of, of rivers and streams. And Coleomaya up in the, in the mountains. Here are some more examples of of, uh, of robber flies, uh, relatively diminutive ones that are typically found out in sandy areas. That's where you find a lot of robber flies uh, and some are specialists in that kind of a, of a habitat. 
but they also get a lot larger. Uh, and so the Efferia, for example, uh, are a, about an inch long. And the female on the left there, she has a blade-like ovipositor that she uses to, to plant her eggs in, in either the ground or in, in, uh, in foliage. Her larvae will probably be predatory underground. The males, on the other hand, have these enlarged claspers on their rear end. And, and so, uh, you know, that's their external genitalia. Uh, and you can tell the different species apart by the configuration of those claspers. Uh, I am not one who could do that, however. These, uh, some robber flies get even larger than that. This is, is probably an inch and a quarter. This scleropoga scler that is waving to us there. Um, again, typically, typical of arid habitats, when it's hot, they perch on vegetation so they don't scorch themselves. Here's an even larger one, a proctocanthus. Um, it's on its, it's propping itself up again to avoid overheating. That's one way flies thermoregulate. But very, uh, very good predators. They can tackle insects much larger than themselves. A fly like this could, could catch a grasshopper, a dragonfly even. Uh, some prey on tiger beetles are one of the few insects that can keep up with and, and uh, kill the tiger beetles. Robber flies also sometimes engage in really elaborate courtship rituals. My, my wife Heidi took this picture of a male Surtopogon hovering in front of a female that is busy eating uh, a victim that, that she uh, caught. And so he's waving his elaborate front feet there and he's got some flashy uh, you know, white patches on the sides of his abdomen there and trying to impress her and, and, and get her to uh, get her attention there. These robber flies are, are much smaller, uh, 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 under a quarter of an inch, but same kind of thing. They're, the male is displaying to the female, or in this case, he's late to the party, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, he's displaying the underside of his hind feet, which are covered in silver scales, and uh, that's how he's trying to get her attention. But, you know, sometimes no means no, and she will let him know in, uh, know in certain terms that uh, she is not interested. Uh, among the pollinating flies are the bee flies, and they're named not only for their resemblance to bees, uh, but some species are parasitoids in their larval stage, parasitoids of solitary bees. And so the female will lay her eggs uh, in the nest of a, a bee that nests underground. In some cases, she'll hover over the burrow and thrust her abdomen to, to catapult her eggs down the burrow and let her uh, larva find its way to a uh, cell, a host cell in that nest. Bee flies can be very beautiful, very ornately marked. If you see a fly with uh, patterned wings, it's most likely going to be a bee fly. Uh, there are other flies that have patterns on their wings, but the ones that you see, the larger ones that you see during the day, most of them are gonna be bee flies. Again, endless forms, endless varieties of lifestyles. Uh, some bee fly larvae are predators of grasshopper eggs underground. They go from uh, grasshopper egg pod to grasshopper egg pod, eating them. Some are parasitoids of blister beetle larvae, all kinds of different life histories for these things. Again, just ridiculously endless forms. And these are very common flies that you will see at all seasons of, of the year, uh, well being spring, summer, and fall. Some are tiny and skinny, and some are thick and fluffy. And this one really intrigued me um, because on the rear of its thorax there, it has these shiny black calluses in the arrangement, same arrangement as the eyes of a jumping spider. And then it has this white belt around its abdomen that, that further gives that impression of a jumping spider. So this fly is, is deter, deterring attacks from the rear by mimicking the face of a jumping spider. Uh, just crazy, crazy. But I've seen jumping spiders hunting on flowers. So this is a really good 
a way to repel them. Long-legged flies, uh, well, you can see why they're named that uh, for, from the picture on the right. Very skittish flies, but very attractive. The ones you typically see are the ones on the left that are bright metallic green or copper red uh, that are dashing around madly on the surface of leaves in, in uh, sunny spots. And they're predatory on other, uh, as adults, they're predatory on other insects, small insects, and as, as, as larvae, they are as well. They occupy a, a wide range of, of niches. Uh, many are found around the water. So like Tachytrechus uh, down there in the lower left, look at the Arista on this guy. I mean, it, 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 he, long, long Arista that's clubbed at the end. I, I couldn't believe this when I saw that. Um, and then you've got Hydrophorus that, that are very much like water striders. They skate on the surface of the water and conduct all their business there, both, both preying on other insects and, and mating. They're smaller than a water strider typically though. And among the most abundant flies you will see outdoors are the, the surfidae, the flower flies, or as they're known in, in Europe, the hover flies. And I don't call them hover flies for nothing. Um, I, I took, this thing was so stock still hovering, I was able to take a, a picture without changing any of the settings on my camera. Um, really remarkable flight capabilities of these flies, most of which are wasp or bee mimics uh, in, in behavior and appearance. So for example, here we have some yellow jacket mimics and the Spilomaya in the lower right, uh, look at the black on the front legs there. He, he'll wave those in front of his face to, to show that he has long antennae, just like a yellow jacket does, when in, in reality his antennae are really short there. And so he'll, he'll wave those around mimicking the antenna of a yellow jacket. Just, you know, the, the behavioral aspects of, of these insects are remarkable. Others are, are bumblebee mimics. And they're, again, about the same size as bumblebees and certainly have the hairy appearance of, of bees. Besides pollinating, another great thing um, about uh, cervids is that so many of them as larvae are predators of aphids. And so if you see, you know, here we see a female that is, is landing on a yucca and she's gonna lay her eggs among those aphids there. And then her larva is going to consume most of those aphids. So if you see like, you know, this slug-like thing in the lower right there, if you see that on your rose bush or something, don't kill it. It's, it's eating the aphids on your rose bush. It's not eating the plant. So another great beneficial aspect to, to, to hoverflies. Others live different lifestyles entirely. So the drone fly is a great honeybee mimic, as you can see on the left there, but its larvae are called rat-tailed maggots. And they live in, in putrid water. Uh, and they have this, this long telescoping snorkel to connect them to the water surface while they're, they're busy uh, grazing on uh, decaying organic matter and microbes. Uh, at the bottom of whatever shallow uh, uh, puddle they're, they're inhabiting. Weirder still um, is, the, is the life cycle of microdon. These are not very common surfids. I did find this one in, in Emerald Valley on one of our trips there. Uh, the larvae I have not seen yet in Colorado, but is no surprise because they live in ant nests. And so this, thing in the, in the insect photo there is the larval stage. It looks so unlike an insect that it was originally classified as a mollusk, like a slug or something. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I guess somebody reared the thing out and figured out, oh, oh well, okay, it's an insect, not, <laughs> not a limpet or something like that. So really bizarre. They, the larvae feed on, on the uh, ant larvae uh, inside the nest. How they avoid getting uh, uh, killed by the ants is a bit of a mystery. They probably smell a lot like the ants do. Now these are, are true fruit flies. And as the name implies, they develop as larvae in fruits or in some cases in stems or in galls. Uh, and they tend to be very host specific. And while the ones depicted here, the two on the left are 
are, are ones that, that exploit sunflowers as a host. Uh, there are other species that, uh, that exploit uh, crops that we like, and so they're considered um, a pest. They typically have these pictured wings. And, and in the case of Ragolitis there, which is, by the way, members of that genus include the apple maggot and other orchard pests of, of great consequence to, to agriculture. Um, the markings on the wings rep, you know, are again mimicking spiders. They look like the legs of a spider, a crab spider or a jumping spider, and they move the wings in a manner that will amplify that uh, ruse. Tachinid flies are, are, could be mistaken for house flies or uh, flesh flies or other flies, except that most of the time they're easily recognized by a really spiny butt. Uh, they have long spines coming out the, the, the rear of the abdomen usually. Um, so they're very spiny looking things typically. Uh, and they're parasitoids of other insects, especially caterpillars. And here we see one that is approaching a, uh, the, the caterpillar of a white line sphinx moth. And either she's already been successful or another uh, tachinid has because the white flecks that you see on the front of the caterpillar here, those are all tachinid fly eggs. So she glues them to the surface of the caterpillar. And when they hatch, her larvae bore inside the caterpillar and feed on it from the inside out, avoiding all the, the major organs until uh, the very end. And eventually you'll get, oh, from, from this caterpillar, you could probably get half a dozen tachinids out of it, I would imagine, um, because they're not, the tachinids here in this case aren't very large. Uh, again, really bristly flies of, of different shapes and sizes, but always kind of with that spiny butt. Here are some more examples. Um, Paradigenia rutiloides on the, on the right there is a huge fly about the size of a bumblebee. And if you've got rabbit brush blooming right now, go look for this thing. It's, it's worth, worth, uh, worth taking a gander at. They're spectacular uh, insects. And here's a, here's a few more. Uh, Belvosia is not very common, but you, there's no mistaking that gold ass. Uh, I mean, wow. Um, and then in the lower right, whereas most tachinids are diurnal and they're, they're overwhelmingly parasitoids of, of caterpillars, Ormia in the lower right there is a parasitoid of crickets. And so it's nocturnal. This one came to a black light at, at uh, Jimmy Camp uh, Creek Park. Um, they can hear the cricket chirps and then orient to them, lay an egg in the cricket and, uh, or on the cricket and the larva will consume the cricket. Bot flies are never fail to get your attention if only because they're enormous. They're uh, about the size of a bumblebee. There are several different kinds. Um, this particular kind is a rodent bot. And so its host would be a ground squirrel typically, maybe a wood rat. Uh, there are other species that are, are bat, or excuse me, bat, um, rabbit. <laughs> Uh, parasitoids. The, the larvae live subcutaneously under the skin of the host feeding on flesh. Uh, they create these big bulges uh, on the host and eventually exit the host and pupate uh, and then emerge as adult flies. The adult flies do not feed. They have accumulated all the energy they need in that larval state. Uh, there are other species that um, are even grosser still that inhabit the nasal cavities of deer or the stomach lining of horses. Um, and they get out, you can imagine how they get out uh, as well. I'm going to leave that to your imagination for a little bit. Uh, uh, but I mean, truly spectacular insects, but uh, overwhelmingly disgusting life story. Um, so I apologize for that, but boy, these are, are really, uh, if you see one of these, there's no mistaking it. And lastly, uh, we have louse flies, and, and these are bird related too, because uh, the overwhelming majority of these are bird parasites. 
And so you, you look at those claws, uh, they're like grappling hooks that can anchor them among the feathers of birds and allow them to, to uh, be very agile uh, and avoid the beak of the bird if it's trying to pluck it away. Um, they feed on the blood of, of the host. There are species that, uh, that, are, that have mammal hosts as well. Some of those are wingless. Uh, and so even look more like a tick or, or a louse. Um, but the really bizarre thing about these that they also share in common with tsetse flies, by the way, is that the female breeds one offspring at a time within her body. So the larva grows entirely within her body, uh, matures within her body, feeding on a milk gland is how scientists phrase it. Uh, and then at when it's fully developed, the female, it exits the female and pupates immediately, either on the host or on the ground, uh, depending on whether uh, the, the thing is, is a winged animal, winged insect or not. Uh, and then you'll have another generation to go. But this idea of breeding one offspring at a time to maturity basically uh, is very mammalian-like and very uncharacteristic of, of, of any other insect, a, a true oddity in the insect world. But again, most of these are, are, are uh, parasitoids of, of birds. And so if you handle birds, you may well run across one of these at, at your, uh, you know, at uh, a uh, mist netting uh, or something, or a banding station. Well, flies do have their enemies uh, besides us. Uh, they might be other flies, <laughs> uh, like the robber fly here that has killed uh, another kind of fly, uh, or they might be a nuisance to the to the fly. Here, a robber fly has killed a wasp, and it's having to share its uh, meal with, with uh, about five freeloader flies in the family Milichiidae. In the lower right picture, you can barely make them out on top of the wasp here. There's about four or five of them uh, sipping the juices that are coming out of the the, one of the wounds that the robber fly has left in its in its victim there. So, you know, even flies have nuisance flies. I mean, how how bizarre is that, right? And and birds, of course, are a major enemy of, of flies. I mean, we have you know birds called gnat catchers and fly catchers for crying out loud. You know, what do you think they eat? Um, and and they're very adept at catching them. Uh, and then you know the, the swallows there are 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 drinking, but they are also going to be going over bodies of water like that, getting midges and other aquatic flies that are, are emerging from the water there. But by far the most bizarre enemy of flies is a fungus. And so it, it, it occupies the fly and takes over its nervous system to the point where it drives the fly to perch on an elevated surface and die there. And then the fly bursts open and all these spores rain out of it, you know, ostensibly on flies that are passing underneath it, uh, underneath the, the original victim, and then will infect future flies. Um, just bizarre, but very satisfying uh, if you don't like flies uh, to know that they can uh, experience a gruesome death just like you would like them to. Um, <laughs> but um, with that, um, it's, 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 it was time for my publisher to have me plug my, <laughs> my books. Uh, Princeton University Press is carrying these two titles and it's Insectpedia, by the way, not, if you look up Insectopedia, you're going to get an inferior book. Um, well, not an inferior book necessarily, but a different book, not by me. Uh, if you order from the publisher and you use the code ERE30, it should be good for a 30% discount through the end of the year. If that does not work, please let me know uh, and, and I'll take care of that for you. Um, you can, uh, I'm also going to leave you with my contact information there. I have a few copies of Insectpedia that I'm happy to mail, sign and mail to you. If you would like that, you can just contact me and let me know your address and how you'd like to me to inscribe that, and then we'll take up payment later. Uh, but I wanna thank uh, Clark for inviting me to do this. Uh, Tyler Stewart, uh, I think was the program chair maybe before the, our new person. Uh, my wife for putting up with me as I tried to figure out PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> my, 
mentors past, present, and future who I learned all this stuff from, and all of you for attending and uh, staying with us. I hope you haven't fallen asleep, uh, or, or if you did, I hope you had a good nap. Uh, thank you. All right, well, thanks, Eric. Give Eric a round of applause. Oh, I, I, I forgot a couple things, by the way. Um, if you like your Death by Chocolate event in February, right, you can thank one of the uh, biting midges for pollinating the cacao tree. It's the only thing that pollinates the tree you get your chocolate from. So interesting. Yeah, there's a good thing there, and and the uh, the blowflies that that you typically find on carcasses are some are now actually licensed by the FDA as a medical uh, what is it a, 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 oh. Um, uh, sanitary medical, uh, sterile medical device because they're employed to clean wounds that have become infected because the fly larvae not only feed only on decaying tissues, uh, but they also secrete chemicals that are antibacterial and promote the healing process. So if you ever wind up with, uh, God forbid, if you ever wind up with a a uh, wound that is infected and, and it's surgically difficult to fix that, ask about medical maggots. Um, that, could be a <laughs> that could be a lifesaver for you. I kid you not. Look them up. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we do have some time for questions. Um, I guess if anyone, we'll start with the, the live audience and then we'll move online if anyone has any questions. Mark, did you, did you say why, um, the, um, what the purpose of the bee mimic flies was? Yeah, so Linda's asked uh, what is the purpose of the bee mimic? Is it just, um, is it a defensive thing or? Yeah, um, yeah. many insects mimic bees and, and wasps because if you can convince a potential predator that you can defend yourself with a sting, um, it pays to do so. And so that's, I mean, they've arrived at that mimicry through convergent evolution, uh, but it's worked so well that, that you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's become really honed uh, to where it's very difficult, sometimes even for me in the field, to tell whether an insect is a fly or a wasp um, because of the way they fly is very similar because you know the way they walk even uh, might might be very similar the way they sound some some uh, flies have wing beat frequencies very similar to that of the wasp model that they're that they're uh, impersonating so one of the questions I had at the beginning was, you said there's 44 species of mosquitoes in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Is that a lot? <laughs> I mean, I did, are there a lot more it, in other parts of the country or that just seems like a lot for us? It, it's, 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 it's more species than I would have expected, to be honest. Um, I mean, but then again, I mean, here in Kansas, I'm in Leavenworth, Kansas in the Northeast corner, uh, you know, by the Missouri River. So we have the Eastern forest meeting the prairie uh, here. Um, I found, last year I found 13 species just in my yard. Uh, so um, that's probably a relatively low number. You get to the tropics and it, it is way more species because it's a lot wetter. Uh, remember they, they, they breed in, in water. So the, the more water resources you have, for mosquitoes, the more diversity you're going to get, certainly the more abundance you're, you're going to get. And if you have, um, you know, if you want to discourage mosquitoes, you know, empty your bird bath uh, or, or have some kind of uh, moving water in your bird bath, um, you know, dump out flower positive accumulated water. It doesn't take hardly any water for mosquitoes to breed in. Um, and, and I mean, I've, I've, I've you know, tires, Discarded tires are a favorite breeding location for mosquitoes. So, um, yeah, be mindful of that in your on your own property. All right, Michael has a question. Speaking of mosquitoes, they eat me alive. 
my wife tells me because I eat too much sugar and I also hear blood type, true or false? So the question was from Michael, he gets bit by a lot of mosquitoes, but his wife doesn't. So he's, she says it's because he eats too much sugar ah. or his blood type. <laughs> so do you know if there's anything to blood type or, or sweetness? Uh, oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> well, your, your blood is not going to contain sugar. So, uh, uh, that's probably not an issue. Blood type. There is some evidence that some blood types, uh, attract mosquitoes more. But the interesting thing, and I, again, I apologize for forgetting to mention this, humans are usually a, a host of last resort for mosquitoes. They, the overwhelming majority are bird feeders. And, and so, you know, I, I'm wondering if the decline in birds is actually one reason we see periodic, you know, more frequent spikes of things like West Nile virus, which is prim primarily a bird disease that doesn't, doesn't usually kill birds. Um, but circulates among bird populations. So, you know, if, if we don't have those bird populations for mosquitoes to feed on, um, is it, are they managing to get the virus from the few birds they do feed on and then bring it to us because we're a more abundant host? Uh, you know, I don't, I haven't been able to get an answer from the mosquito people I know about that, but, um, you know, with climate change and, and disappearance of, declines and disappearance of, of uh, birds and other more usual hosts for mosquitoes, you know, I would expect us to see, uh, you know, certainly more frequency in bites, uh, but potentially more frequencies of, of, uh, of diseases that we'd rather not have. Um, you know, I mean, we don't, we've extirpated ma malaria, thankfully, but, um, you know, that's still a potential threat you know, along the southern border, uh, and as as climate changes and, and things shift, you know that might be a a, a, a problem. Um, and if you travel abroad, certainly, you know, take your get your meds in you, um, and and you know, be mindful of wearing uh, you know mosquito netting, especially when you're uh, you're sleeping. Um, the mosquitoes in the tropics carry things far far worse than than you'll encounter in the Northern Hemisphere. So I think Anna Joy had a question. All right, so this might be a little nerdy, um, but I was thinking about, you know, some of the families you showed that have this huge range of diversity in appearance. And you mentioned a few of them, certain features that kind of market as one family, like the, the ones with the spiky butts or the red dot on the butt. I know for a lot of families, you look at wing venation, do you know, is that all, or in certain cases, is that supported by looking at DNA? Or do you still mostly just go off of um, trusting that if they share the morphology, then they must actually be um, genetically related? Wow, that's, that's, not, that's a perfectly legit question. Um, well, yeah, the more we, the more DNA analysis that's done, uh, you know, molecular DNA analysis that is done, the 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 more our our uh, the more it informs the evolutionary relationships among different families, and and so we'll we'll see changes in in relationships between some of them. I haven't heard about that happening too much in flies. Uh, definitely happened with cockroaches, and termites, to where they're now in the same order. Um, so really weird things can happen, uh, but oh, I, I'm working on a project right now identifying uh, insects that were collected as part of a pollinator survey uh, in the Pikes Peak region. Uh, Julian Rosasco at the University of Colorado uh, sent me a bunch of specimens that his students prepared, and um, I'm still trying a year later, and I'm still trying to get trying to get through the tail end of the flies. I, I came to, to to muscoid flies, which are the house flies, the root maggot flies, the dung flies, and their kin. I have a hard time even figuring out what family I'm looking at, and I, I, I've got a microscope and a pin specimen. Um, you know, you have, and and at one time they were all lumped in one family, the the house fly family, and, and, they, and then they were split. But unless you, yeah, unless you're a specialist on some of these things, even the morphology will just 
is just impossible. Uh, it, it all hinges on patterns of bristles coming out of their various parts of their body. And if one's broken, then you're out of luck. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, the morphology is still what we're mostly going by, but, but you're spot on when you talk about uh, molecular DNA analysis, and that probably will change some things, yes. So you're saying I should stick with birds? <laughs> Just don't go to, to, to muscoid flies for sure. <laughs> All right, any more questions? We have time, I think, for one more. And you can email me too if you think of something later. I, I have no problem with that. I, I uh, very much enjoy the friendship of all of you folks out there. Yeah, I think um, I did decide on the name of my new heavy metal band. It's either going to be Dark winged fungus gnat or rat tailed maggot, one of the two. So. But really, thanks, Eric. It's great to see you. Um, and uh, we'll be in touch. And let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you kindly. And enjoy the cooler weather. And, uh, yeah. Talk to you soon. All Have right. Good night. And thanks enjoy the cooler else. weather. And I thought that was kind of weird. <laughs> Hi, everybody.